and welcome to Fat Squirrel Speak. Today is Thursday, July 13th. I'm Amy Beth, also known as Fat Squirrel on Ravelry and the Fat SQRRL on Instagram. Welcome. <sighs> welcome back. Welcome over. Welcome, welcome. All the welcomes. Um, today's episode is going to have, well, I'll be frank with you. I didn't get a ton of crafting done this last couple of weeks. I've been getting ready. Um, the Super Summer Knit Together is next week in Nashville, Tennessee. So I've been doing tons of sewing. Um, and then also I just feel kind of out of sorts because this, so that's next week. That's having next weekend or next week really. Um, and then this weekend I'm taking the kid to their college orientation. What? And so not tons of crafting has gotten done, but I do have finished object and I have some sewing finished objects. And I have some board games to talk about. But before we get into that, I just want to touch base. Last time we talked, I mentioned that I am not a fan of powdered sugar because I have this weird thing where if powdered sugar has been opened, like, okay, in the United States, powdered sugar, I don't think it's the same thing as the caster sugar, right? Powdered sugar is like more, is more finely. It is like a powder versus caster sugar, which I believe still does have some granular attributes, right? Neither here nor there. In the United States, usually it comes in plastic. Like it'll come in either a plastic bag that's inside of a box. So sometimes they sell it in one pound quantities, uh, but the most frequently you'll see is two pound quantities and they're in like a plastic bag. And I have this dumb thing where if the powdered sugar is not brand new, like it literally has not just been opened, I can taste weird mustiness in it or yeah, it just tastes like, like your strange auntie's house would taste if it were a flavor. Do you know what I mean? Like it has that kind of like, anyway, we're not alone. If you also experience this weirdness, there's actually a lot of us out here who have this thing, right? It's a total thing. It's not just us. You are not alone. I thought I was just a weirdo. I mean, I am clearly a weirdo, but, and you're a weirdo too. I love weirdos, but we're not alone. This is a thing that happens to people. One person suggested that the theory is that the reason that we have this thing is that they use um, cornstarch in the powdered sugar to help it like as an anti-caking agency, or as an anti-caking agent. And what happens is when the cornstarch is, is exposed to air, so like when the bag becomes unsealed, you know, you put cornstarch in your refrigerator, right? To absorb odors uh, and it absorbs fluid. Like that's just what it does. So when it's in the powdered sugar, it also does the same thing like in your pantry, it absorbs odors and so that's, although my pantry doesn't really taste, smell like my auntie's kitchen, I don't think, or auntie's kitchen, my auntie's house. I'm not even talking about an auntie for real, I'm just like a thought auntie, theoretically auntie. But anyway, that's what it does and that's the only reason probably we taste that way. What? So lots of folks also said that the reason, the way they get around this is that they just make their own powdered sugar, which I've heard of before, but I'm going to be honest with you. I just never, I never really believed. <laughs> Isn't that silly? What you do is you literally take just regular cane sugar and then you pulse it in a food processor until it becomes powdered sugar. But in my head, I'm like, that feels like it has to be like some sort of atomic food processor, right? Like with the sharpest blades, because it has to cut those like tiny little grains of sugar and it has to pulverize them. And I just thought, but I don't know why I don't think it's possible because like, it does seem like it could happen. I don't know, in my head, I just always was a block that I was just like, I don't think my food processor is again, an atomic, like industrial in the Hadron Collider level of food processor, but apparently you don't even need that. So you just whip up your own. So I'm gonna have to try that next time and I will, uh, I'll continue to report back on my experiences. <laughs> For the like 12 of you who care. <laughs> Whatever is important to us, okay? So anyway, I just had to, I just touch back that one um but yeah let's get into it so knitting i have a finished object pa, 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 pa. i'll put a picture of it in here quick 
note, I don't know why the picture video quality is so crazy in like these um, finished object videos. Um, apologies. And here's my recalibrate sweater. So, um, yes, you can totally see that. There's a little bit of like a gauge wonkiness right here. It's not a drop stitch. It's not a split stitch. I'm hoping that it'll, I'll, I'll tell you later in the thing, and I hope it'll just like fix itself magically. <laughs> um, but yeah, here it is. Ta -da! Super pleased with it. Again, um, here is my underbust line. Here is my bending waist line. Wash it. Maybe that is your, whatever. I don't even know what your waist is anymore. Here's where I like to wear my pants nowadays. <laughs> Here is the middle of my B belly. How about that? That's where my belly button line is. It's right there. Um, and then, yeah, I just like to wear my stuff up a little bit higher nowadays. It just feels comfortable. Okay. Sorry, a little flash there. Um, but yeah, no. very pleased with it. It's super fun. Uh, it's a lower neckline on one side and a higher neckline on the other. So you can also flip it back to front. It's, it is symmetrical. If you prefer to have more or less coverage, um, have fun. So that's my recalibrate. It is a pattern by Shane Alliance Designs. And my yarn was from Ash and Bumble. It's their Merino fingering. And they are out of Indianapolis. I purchased it at the Hoosier Hills Fiber Festival. Uh, it's 100% superwash merino, 438 yards to 100 gram ball. And my colorways were oak moss and celadon. And then the dark green is some quince that I just had over dyed. Um, and this is what, so this is what's left. I used two balls. So this is the second ball of this one. I used one ball of this one and then a 50 gram ball of this one. And this also includes any provisional cast-ons that I used or bind-offs that I used. Um, I just used this yarn. So I'm very, of course, I'm pleased with it. Psh, surprise, not, but isn't it cute? I will be honest with you. While I was knitting up this yarn, I, it wasn't anything to do with the dyeing process. Don't get, like, that's not it at all. Uh, that is not it at all. But I was, like, not loving knitting with this yarn. Um... But I am pleased with how it blocked up, how it kind of plumped up a bit. It got a little beefier um, and it felt a little bit less anemic once I got it washed and into the sweater. Now this, I have not worn this yet. And to be quite frank, I washed it, spun it out, laid it out to dry for a while and then popped it in the dryer for like what was supposed to be 10 minutes, but ended up being 20 because I forgot. So it will definitely kind of like um, stretch out a bit with wear, especially if I manage to wear it to Super Summer Knit Together in Nashville, Tennessee, and it's like 98 degrees Fahrenheit. It'll probably stretch out a little bit more. But I did knit to a firmer or tighter gauge than is suggested in the pattern. I think my gauge was 1.17 difference. So if, for example, if her gauge was one stitch to an inch, mine would have been 1.17 stitches to an inch. That's clearly not the gauge, I'm just telling you. So I have more stitches per inch. Um, and that's just a personal preference. Like sometimes I just, sometimes at a looser gauge, if the, the, the knitwear, rather than being energized like this in the garter stitch, for me, it starts to feel a little bit more flaccid and I don't love it as much, uh, which is one of the reasons I didn't enjoy knitting this one as much because the yarn was a little bit skinnier before it got blocked. It felt like that, like kind of, and there are some places where my gauge got funky. You can see right there. But I'm hoping that eventually that will block out over a couple of different um, wares and, you know, washing cycles because it's not like I split stitches or drop stitches. It's just I could even go in with a, a, a you know, a crochet hook or a knitting needle and kind of zhuzh the stitches around it to kind of take up the extra um, and help even out the gauge manually. But apparently I don't care that much. So, yeah. I used the contrast color for my sleeve cuffs and then everything else is the two colors 
of Ash and Bumble, and I'm very pleased with it. Super fun knit to do if you um, like if you like to do shawls. It has a very shawl-like feel. The rows are approximately that long, versus a sweater where you're like the rows. Often, if you're a bigger person, the rows just get longer. Um, Sorry, the teeth is like flittering up and down the stairs. That's distracting me. Um, what else? The finishing is, and oh, so I guess maybe the other thing that makes it feel more like a shawl is that there are more waypoints in the design. So, you know, you're working on this bit, then you're working on this bit, and then you're working on the side, and you work on this side, and then you're doing the little side panels and then the cuffs and then you're doing this. So it has more like more frequent stopping points, which for me helps to motivate me because it's there are like more there are smaller, more achievable goals throughout versus a sweater, which sometimes just feels like, you know, once you get to the arm side, like if you're doing top down, like once you get past the sleeves, it's just like, okay, now I'm gonna be knitting for 700 years. So I think maybe that's also why it kind of feels more like a shawl. And of course it's a similar um you know, you're usually using fingering weight for shawls and smallish needles. So, and the needle, of course, the gauge is firmer than you would usually use for a shawl, but it's, it, it just has that feel to it. So similar quantities of yarn. And this is definitely one that you can use scraps for. Um, you can use, you know, you can use whatever you have on hand. You could, if you're fairly comfortable with knitting for yourself or for whomever you're knitting for, it's also very easy to change your gauge if you want to use like a DK um, or a sport weight. I would say it's very easy to get the idea because Sheena is very good about having very clear schematics with lots of uh, measurements on them. So it's it's easier to, and there's not like a bust start shaping or anything like that that you would have to kind of wiggle more with. Um, so yeah, I would say that it's it would be very approachable. Again, if you're a fairly confident knitter, it's it's pretty easy to modify. Um, what else? And of course, there's lots of project photos that you can get um, either on Instagram or Ravelry or wherever. I apologize, my phone is on because my dog, is, Gus, is experiencing a lot of allergies and we have a call into the vet for his medication and i'm a, i think that i don't know if they're gonna like give it to us or if we have to like go in for an appointment for him so i don't want to miss the vet when they call so thank you for being patient as my phone pings in the background um anything else hmm, just a highly enjoyable you know, also i've knit the cropped version there is a hip length version but of course you know you could pretty much i think a few I may be a liar who lies, but I may think that there's even somebody who's done more like a dress version, but I could see how you could do it. It would be quite fun because what you could do is add your shaping in this, like, like if you didn't want a perfectly straight, um, garment silhouette, like if you wanted it more A-line, you could totally put that A-line shaping just right in this little side gusset and just do some decreases as you went up and it would be, you could totally make it an A-line option, which would be very cute. So yes, yay, so fun. I'm I'm not gonna lie, I'm also desiring like a um, racing stripe version where I do like the whole thing solid and then just have like one asymmetrical wide stripe right like here or here depending. Um, I'm very much craving that. You could also do like um, some intarsia and have it like a color block version, which I think would be super cute. And it's garter stitched throughout. So for me, wraps and turns or things like when you're doing, um, you know, switching your yarns for intarsia and things like that, it's easier to hide like little wobbles in my mind in the garter. Now I say that as a person who's never done intarsia garter, but wraps and turns are easier to hide. So it seems like it would be similar. <laughs> It seems like for more forgiving, uh, but wouldn't that be cute to do just like a shoulder and then back one color and then have, wouldn't that be cute? Anyway, the options are limitless. Not sponsored by. <laughs> Although Shana Lines has gifted me um, patterns in the past. I don't think that one, I think that, I think I've purchased that one. And I also purchased my 
next knit, which is her shoulder season sweater. So, uh, shoulder season. I am knitting mine with Leading Men Fiber Arts. This is their showstopper base, which is a 75-25 superwash merino nylon, 463 yards to 100 grams. Um, I'm knitting it with spruce it up, and then I think the other one is walnut or something like that. Black walnut? No, that might be a lot. Oh, similar-ish. Anyway, it's almost the same color they had a sample in, except I got a slightly different color, a slightly darker color for my little epaulets. Right? So this is going to be the back of my sweater. Isn't that cute? So one of the great things about um, leading with fiber arts is A, they're cute as can be and lovely human beings. But another nice thing is that you can buy all of their colorways in, well, I shouldn't say that, but I'm fairly confident you can buy all their <laughs> For example, I, show, I saw them at a show and they had the 50 gram skein or maybe even, was it only a 10? No, it wasn't a mini. They had the short skein of this color and then they had the sample that was this color and then they had one skein, I think, of the showstopper. But I needed two and a half skeins. I needed about 250 grams. So I just ordered it there and they sent it to me for free. When they sent me the, I paid for the yarn. They, they sent the, the shipping with me. Yet another, not sponsored by moment. Um, but I believe that most of their yarns are available in the 50 gram, or at least most of their colorways, especially the show stop. But... <laughs> Did I mention that I was feeling a little bit like out of sorts? <laughs> okay. Showstopper is the base. I believe it's available in 50 gram Hanks for the colors that they offer. Not all of their bases are available in 50 gram hanks. But it makes it very convenient for something like this where you um, you don't need a full third skein. Right? Even my hair looks crazy today. What's going on? Okay. So that is what I have been knitting. I've knit a little bit more on a muscle bra. I don't know what I'm gonna take for my retreat knitting. I think I can take this sweater because I have quite a bit of the back to do and it's garter. Huzzah. Um, I did switch to, I was originally using zeros because I, it is a firmer gauge than the, for example, the um, recalibrate. The front is not garter. The front is like a, a, a stockinette with a garter ridge every once in a while. Um, so I was knitting on zeros, but the only zeros I had were um, chow goos, which are usually my favorite needle, but they were just feeling a little slippy um, to knit at a firmer gauge for me. So I did switch eventually to ones. And these are just some old knit picks gals I had lying about. I don't know why I don't have more wood. Well, I do know I don't have more wood zeros and ones because they break if you sneeze at them. But um, I needed a little bit more grab. My hands were starting to feel very fatigued at that, at the slickery needle. So just a tip in case if you're a newer needle and you've not experimented with different needle types, like, um, well, needle types, materials. <laughs> um, it sometimes helps if you're feeling like it feels too slippery to go to a wood or a bamboo or something like that. Um, just try to try some different things. And if you're in an SSK, you can try it in the try it on room. Okay, look. Not sponsored by. Oh my God, are you going? Are you gonna be there early? I wasn't gonna be there early. I was gonna be there Wednesday, like I was supposed to be. But then I found out there's gonna be a pool party. I just realized, I was like, was I allowed to say that? Yeah, of course, because it's on the Discord group. <laughs> So if you're gonna be there Tuesday and you wanna go swimming with me and the gals, or at least some of the gals, uh, some of the folks, I will uh, be at the pool party with my fat body on and also a swimsuit, okay? I really feel like we need to have a pool every day. <laughs> Not that I expect them to provide that. But like after I started thinking about it, I was like so warm. It's so warm in Nashville in July. Um, I was like, 
wouldn't it be amazing if we just had a pool thing like every afternoon? Oh. There's not a pool on site. Like there, it's like a, you can, you can rent pools through a company called Swimply, not sponsored by, I don't know anything about their any things. I just know that that's a thing that, it's like an Airbnb for pools. Um, but wouldn't that be amazing? <sighs> I just want to swim all the time. Anyway, then in sewing, I have some finished objects. So, uh, I did a test sew for So Liberated, which I won't show you, but it's a pair of pants. And she has posted her ver version. There's the Chanterelle pants. Um, so So Liberated, I don't, I think maybe only one pair has been posted so far, but I'll show them to you when the pattern is released, but they're very enjoyable. And then I also finished a Torrens box top. So Torrens box top is a pattern by Muna and Broad, and I will put some picture slash film of me in the top here. Here is my Torrens box top. So again, this is like my um, underbust waistline. This is my hinging waistline. And it has been shortened uh, by a bit. But I think I might go up another hem. I don't know. Again, I'm just going to wear it and find out. Uh, there are two sleeve widths. I did the wider sleeve width. But yeah, here is it. No other adjustments in terms of, you know, length or anything like that. Again, I haven't decided. I don't know. Maybe I don't. Yeah, I guess. And I still have a lot of ease, but it's just like the, you know, your body. Yeah, I think I could use a little extra. I would have a little bit less. And again, this is not a fit. Okay. Let me just also say I appreciate that you have, might have notes for me in terms of a fit. I don't, I'm not asking for notes. Like when I say this, I'm actually just trying to work it out for myself. So I am decide. like this is not a fitted top. Like if it were a fitted top, I would be just not, would not be happy with how the, you know, it's working. But so this is just me working it out for myself. I appreciate that you have opinions about how it should or should not fit. Um, but that's something I'm just gonna work on for myself. So I appreciate, thank you. No notes requested. Um, but yeah, it's definitely great for a wearable wet muslin in terms of it is in fact wearable. Okay. Uh, and the reason I am trying, I'm trying to get some more woven shirts into my life because I feel like knit knitwear, just, it's like, not that all knitwear pills by any stretch of the imagination, but it's just hard for me to determine what is and is not going to pill until after I've already bought it either as a ready to wear or like as something that I'm going to sew. And it's just frustrating to be investing in that and then having stuff pill up. And because I sew for a living, like I'm constantly having string and lint and things, which just is like amplified more um, lots of times on knits. So I'm just trying to find some more wovens, but I'm used to wearing knits. Like I'm used to the fit of a knit. And so part of it is just like me getting past that like hurdle of what I am you know, comfortable with and used to. And so I just have not worn a ton of woven tops in the past and just, just gotta get used to it. And again, experiment with different fits and things like that to see what I like. But um, I think I'm pleased with this one. And again, it's a great option if you're doing something with a print that you don't wanna have like a bust start in um, or that you don't wanna have like a big arm slide, like deeper cut in. Um, this one would translate really well to a bigger jazzier print if that's something you're looking for. Sink. So Torrens Bok Top is a pattern by Muna and Rod and it is available in do, 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 sizes 40 inches and this is a bust measurement excuse me 40 inches to 64 inches but they are lovely humans and if you are on the uh, uh, on the upper end of that spectrum. So if you fall outside their sizing on the top end, they will happily draft you a cus like a, a, a pattern for you. Because they're amazing. And, and it's a basic box top. And box top is just something that is going to get washed out. But you can see, like, it's just like a straight line. Um, and so you can do a sleeveless version that just has like a cuff band. Or you can do... Um, long sleeve. What I did was the long sleeve version and just shortened the sleeves a bit. It has a facing for, um, a facing with interfacing for the facing. Uh, another option would be 
bias tape. That's what I was trying to say. <laughs> but it's written with a facing. Um, yeah, so my version is actually two sizes smaller than what I should wear for my bust size. And the reason I did that is, I don't know why, actually I do know why, but I just don't love a super oversized shirt on myself. Part of it might be because I tend to have like a fuller pant, like um, a wider leg pant or a skirt that's got some gathering. And so it's nice to have some contrast between like um, a closer fit and a, and a looser fit in my head. I'm sure lots of it is fat phobia that just is like super ingrained in me. And so I see a bigger silhouette and I feel a little bit conflicted about that. I love the way it looks on other people. For some reason, I'm not able to adopt loving that on my own body. Um, and I'm sure some of it has to do with the fact that as a fat person, I've often worn oversized clothing to like hide in um, or because like, I needed to buy a men's size and so it like hung down further on my shoulder and so like there's all these things so like I am I'm sure part of it is me kind of reacting against that feel um and like weird stuff about fat people being sloppy and like there's all sorts of like just crummy stuff that I'm sure is in my brain that I'm like just not able to quite come to terms with in order to like love that silhouette on myself or maybe I just don't like that silhouette on myself who knows? Um, but so that's the reason I made mine a couple sizes smaller because I did want a closer fit. I think what I will do for my next one, I didn't do any modifications, but I think what I'll do for my next one is actually give myself a little bit of a um, dartless full bust adjustment in the front, which really goes against the like thought process of a boxy top. I understand. I know I'm just being crazy. But um, just to give myself a little bit more room in the fullest part of my bust, so I think I might try that on the next one. I did a dartless full bust adjustment on my Ashton tank top and I really like that look. So I think I'll try it here. That way it gives me a little bit more volume. And the reason is it would give me a little bit more volume but wouldn't extend the shoulder side seam down any further. So I, I think it would help me feel, get a balance between the volume that's originally intended and then just what I am comfortable in. So that's a thing. And I also, and this is shortened also, I apologize. So I shortened the sleeve to like a three quarters ish kind of sleeve. And then I also shortened the hem by about three inches. And I might actually go a little bit shorter because it kind of falls in that place between like a true crop and then like a hip length or a, a waist. So I kind of like, I might play with that just a tiny bit. Um, even on this one, because what I did, because it's such a lightweight fabric, this is handkerchief weight linen from linfabric-store.com. So this is their handkerchief weight. And um, I was trying to remember what color it is because it's not color. I think this is like a, the gray one, like whatever. You don't need no colors. It's fine. Um, because I wasn't sure about the shirt itself. And like, it's sometimes really nice to just wear a shirt for a while to see like, cause you know, you try it on and you think, oh, it's gotta be shorter. But of course, once you make it shorter, unless you just like fold up your hem quite a bit more, um, you don't, you can't make it longer again. Um, so what I was trying to do is give myself some flexibility. I'm gonna wear it a few times. And I'll also give me an idea, like, do I really want to add the FBA? Like, do I just wanna make a bigger size? So I'm hoping that that'll kind of give me that information as I wear it a few times. But what I did for the hem was literally just surge the edge and then hem it. So it's not a really beautiful finished hem, but I knew that it would give me some more flexibility in length because if for example, I do wanna hem it up, I don't have to take this hem out. I can just fold it and I won't have like four layers of fabric. Um, whereas if I had done a traditional hem where I turned it under and then turned it under again, if I then wanted to shorten it even more, I've got four layers of fabric and that can, especially in a lighter fabric, it can, well, just in the that contrast in general can kind of look, it could give you kind of like a crinoline in effect where you like make your shirt blouse out more. So um, yeah, we'll just see what I'm gonna do with that eventually. And then, so that's the Torrens box top by Muna and Broad. 
And then the next thing I'll talk about is what I am currently wearing. So here's a picture of me in it or a video or something. So here is whoop, a table that I ran into. Here is my uh, mashup of the Joni and Gilbert top. So you can see like, again, the Joni has a split hem and so I don't believe the Gilbert does. So it would definitely make a lot more sense if it did not, but as basically a wearable muslin. Uh, only three buttons. Hooray, hooray. Um, the sh Joni also has a different cuff, so it's a bit shorter. Um, this is the original sleeve, but you fold it up to have like a, an expo like a, like a cuffed cuff. Also, a thank you for being patient as like I show you my vacuum cleaner and the wall plaster that I have not repainted. Human! Um, so, but I just liked the length this way, so I just left it there. And so this is actually, this is the same fabric base. So this is also the handkerchief weight linen from, which I want to say is like a three and a half ounce uh, per square yard, or yeah, it's per square yard, right? Three and a half ounce um, from fabric-store.com. And again, not sponsored by. This is sort of a mashup between the Joni top, which is a pattern by So Liberated, and the Gilbert top, which is a pattern by Helen's Closet. And really, it's secretly just the Joni top with the little ties from, <laughs> from the Gilbert, but I want to make sure that I give homage to both because I think this the overall look of it is definitely more strikingly Gilbert just because those ties are very distinctive. Um, and the reason I did that was because I had just finished, well, just, I had recently finished a Tesso for the Joni top and I had already done all of my adjustments. And so for my body, I needed to do an FB, a full bust adjustment and I needed to change the sleeve from, I don't know, I can't remember now which size I did, if I did a 22 or a 24 but I needed the sleeve from the 28. So it's it's a bit, right? Like you have to do your full bust adjustment, then you have to trace that out, and then you have to switch your arm scythe over to the bigger size. And, and so I was just feeling like I needed some more instant gratification. So I knew I could do, I know I can do the same thing for the Gilbert top or, or very similar, but because I'd already done it for the Joan just recently, I was like, you know what, I'm just gonna, and I didn't even know if I would really like this tie thing, which secretly I think I'd really do. Um, so I just was like, oh, so I'll just use that and then morph this on. And the Gilbert is different. Like the Joni has three panels below the yoke. The Gilbert just has two. Um, the Gilbert, I think, is a slightly boxier look, like a less fitted look. The shoulder, the, um, the shoulder width is greater so that the sleeve will start a little bit lower down here. Um, it does have the camp collar, but I, th I think those are the, those are really the main differences that I could, that I'm thinking that I'm recalling off the top of my head. I think I'll, I said it's a little bit boxier, like the, the Joni has some little bit of waist shaping in the back and the Gilbert I believe is straight, which for my, for doing this length, the shortest length, I think the Gilbert would be fine for me. Um, but that was another thing I was a little bit of afraid of switching to the other one was like, oh, well, I need that extra seam or that extra width in the back that that little bit of, um, it's not really a princess seam, but it has a little bit of flare at the bottom. But I think for the length I like, the Gilbert will be fine. The Joni is also a split hem, which I don't believe the Gilbert is, but I could be a liar who lies. so strange to talk so much when normally I do not talk at all. <laughs> um, what else? Oh yeah. So, so yeah, I just, I just was, uh, just took the, the bit of a cheatery way out and just worked with the pattern that I had already modified and just kind of goosed it up a little bit to look more like that. And I think I really do like the little ties. It's just kind of a fun thing. The reason I was interested in trying the ties is because my last Joni that I did, well, the only other Joni I've done, um, 
I did it in Robert Kaufman Essex linen and I, it was a little stiff for what I wanted for like a summer weight shirt. It felt a little, because it's a little stiffer, it has a little bit less drape. It felt, it gave me like, kind of like workwear vibes, like business, like businessy vibes. Um, and so that's definitely not what I wanted. And I think also because it's kind of cropped, it, it like, again, it kind of gives you that when it's a little bit too structured, it feels more like um, an office-y kind of, I don't know, maybe it's just my own head. And literally, I mean, literally it's just because of my fabric choice, I believe. Uh, but it's kind of fun to have like a little bit of interest in the hemline versus just a straight hemline. So, and that's, I think that um, my Ashton tank top, which is another one of my favorite things to wear, it has a little bit of a dip in the hem because of my full bust adjustment and like how I had to like do things to get it to fit right. But again, I think that little bit of like visual interest in the hemline is, I enjoy that. So, we'll see. I definitely should make just a straight up Joni in like a lighter weight fabric just to see, just to give it a better try. Um, but I also kind of love this little tie version. It's fun. And it's like, you know, when I was in junior high, high school, and like the girls wear their umbros and their tied up t-shirts. I couldn't do that. Because they did not make umbros for my fat self back then. Nor would I have worn them if they had, quite frankly. Um, but it kind of has like that fun vibe in my head. <laughs> okay. So that's all my crafting. The next thing I'm gonna talk about is board games. So if you're not interested, like I'll totally talk to you later, okay? Okay, thanks folks for being patient. I've had to do a bit of a change in the setup. Uh, I'm having to go to So here is Meadow and then I'll just show. So basically what this game is, is you're building, I guess you would call it a tableau builder. You're selecting cards from a grid and then you're using those cards to build up a meadow in your valley, I guess you could say. And the cards look like this, right? So they are all different. Some of them are vertical, some of them are horizontal. Some of them, right. Are they not the cutest? And so you're building up a tableau. So for example, if you want to play this badger in the tableau that you currently have, you need to have a berry, a bug, and a paw print all showing. So say you're saying, you know, it looks something like blah, 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 there's a bunch of other stuff. It looks something like this. You're like, oh, okay, I've got the berry, the bug, and the paw. So then you're like, okay, so where am I going to put my badger? I'm going to put him on top of this. You have to cover up one of these things. But now you have your badger and you have an exciting animal, but now you don't have a bug anymore because you've covered him up. So there's this constant tension between like, oh, I want to add things, but like, where do I add it so that I don't cover up things I'm going to need later? How can I like get back that thing that I now need? Do I have to add a different, there's different landscapes that you can lay out that you're building on. Um, it's just super duper cute and surprisingly thinky for like how, quote unquote cute it is. Um, Board Game Geek says this is a 2.23 out of 5. So that's their like um, difficulty level. And I would say that's probably pretty accurate. You can, And you can, you know, you could, if you have a little person and you want to play and they just want to play with the cards because they're fun, you know, you could simplify it for them. Uh, it is not language dependent. There are no words on the cards. Um, but it does, again, this like decision of like what to cover up, what to keep, it becomes a little bit chewier than you would normally think it was. Um, and there are other actions you can take. There's this, like how cute is this? There's this campfire board that you can also take actions on where you can get bonus points or um, do other things because each of your, like this is, for example, is like your little thing that you slot in to the card buffet to take your turn and so like this thing is what you do for the car decision and then this is the campfire action and so there's different like each your little these are kind of your turn these little pickets are each your little turn and so you get options of what to do um anyway it's super stinging charming there is a solo mode but i've never played the solo mode 
there are expansions to the game. There's a, or just one, excuse me. I think it's called Downstream, yeah. But the game also has a few little card expansions inside of it. So, I'm not gonna try to get that one out apparently. So, one of them I think is like a holiday one. One of them is if you've, like once you've gone to a national park or something like that, um, you can open up these and this just gives you like, you know, four, three or four or five maybe cards that you can add in to your different decks. And like, let me also discuss, these are your decks. You have North, South, East and West. And you build these little boxes for them. Are they not the cutest? And so it's really nice because your cards fit in there and they slot into the box itself. So when you are ready to play, it's minimal setup. You're not having to like sort through like, oh, this, that, like where do I split these decks up? Um, which is super nice. Another really awesome thing is that if you are curious about your cards, like what the animal is on them, each card has a very tiny, for example, this is C13. So you can go to this card index. You can find C13 and they'll tell you this is a common pheasant. Male pheasants have colorful plumage while female pheasants have gray and brown plumage, which blends in with the surroundings. So each card has a, you know, it's not a ton of information, but if you're not sure, like, is that a dormouse or is that, you know, it'll give you that and you can look up more information on your own. And that's again in addition to the rule book itself, which is pretty substantial. But like anything, if you're intimidated by rule books, there are tons of how to play um, videos and things online. And it's just, again, I've not played the expansion, but I am intrigued and excited to perhaps get it. But we'll just see how that goes. So again, that is Meadow. Sazam! And then the next one I want to talk about is Parks. And this is by Keymaster Games. This one has been out since 2019 and I have been resisting it for so long. For so long, folks. And finally, I'll be honest with you, when I watched the playthroughs, um, it looked beautiful. Like the game itself is really gorgeous. The production value is very high. Uh, and that does match the price tag. This is a $49.99 like manufacturer's suggested retail price. Um, so it's a high production value and it's a gorgeous game. And of course it has the parks as part of the, you know, is the theme of the game. And so like everything about it was like, buy me, buy me. But I resisted because I watched the gameplay online a couple of times and I just thought, sure that this gameplay is really intriguing but then I found that there was a version or excuse me you can play this on boardgamearena.com uh, again no, no sponsorships or anything but you can play this on boardgame arena and so I was lucky enough to play with a friend and I was like oh I think I get it now like because it is highly rated on board game geek it is let's see it's 131 overall and 17 in family like that's their it's like 17th most popular game in family or most highly ranked game and so I knew it had to I just for some reason I just was like I'm not sure why I am resist but so after playing it I decided yes this is definitely not just a pretty face it has a lot of good meat to well maybe not a lot of good meat but it has some meat to it as well it's a little bit easier than the meadow so meadow is 2.23 out of 5 in difficulty on board game arena or excuse me, on Board Game Geek, and this one is 2.145, and I don't know, I think that may be even a little bit ambitious. I think maybe it's more like a two, or maybe not even quite a two. Um, this one is, excuse me, by Keymaster. The art is all by 59 Parks, which is a series of prints, and then the game designer is Henry Audubon. It's one to five players, 10 and up, so a similar age range, 40 to 70 minutes. I didn't mention this. Meadow is um, on Board Game or geek one of the nice things they do is give you like not only the the number of players so exa example meadow it's one to four they'll also say like what people think the game is best at meadow they say is best at two which i would agree um i could maybe three would be fun but i could see that the board could get really tight for your choices um and it could really kind of draw out the time of the game i think two is great for that parks however is probably best at three, which I also would agree because it is another one where you have limited choices where you're placing your worker or your token or whatever. Um, and I think that would get a little bit more intense 
at three, but not be too intense. So I think that those are probably correct estimates of best player counts. Okay, so let me just, let's just take a moment. This book, this game is stupidly pretty. It's a fairly small box, but it is so well designed in terms of like the components and how they're laid out in the box. Um, I'm not gonna lie, I'm a sucker for like a linen print, not even linen, like almost like a canvas texture to the rule book itself is really super gorgeous. Um, and then there's also like a player aid, which I think, yeah, I can see. There's also a player aid, which kind of, you can just lie, you can lay next to the board itself and kind of help you along if, you've, if you're newer to the game or if you're not sure of the actions. And that's super handy to have as well. But look at this nonsense, y'all. You get these little, so this is just what comes in the box. This is not, you don't have to buy anything extra to get this stuff. These lidded, stupid component things. So you, one of the actions you can take is to take photographs of your park. Right. And the components are all like just a stain. So they're not, they're matte. You can see the wood grain and everything. These are the animal tokens and they're all different. And they very cleverly, they've made um, like some jigsaw puzzles and stuff with the artwork from the 59 series. And you can get a bonus animal meeple in them. How genius is that? Genius. So you get two of those that you can place on either end of the player area. This is your little, your board. It's going to kind of be the actions that everybody can take. And then look at this stupid box component. This is so satisfying, y'all. <laughs> Everything has its place. And in fact, when you open the package, it even tells you specifically, and then it even has on the box itself, like where each component belongs so that it'll fit there nicely, which is crazy great. And then like they're also made so that you can just push on one end to get the item out of there. Like, are you kidding me? Right? What? Your, your player markers are these little hiker proof folks. The first player token is like this little sort of enamel-y thing. Right. Oops, sorry. How crazy is that? So in the game, what you're doing is there's going to be, you know, a series. There's like a path that you're all taking, right? There's like all these cards are, you're going to go along and you're hiking along the path. And as you go, you're gathering these resources that are on the bottom. And you have little folks who are like, do, 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 do. And say you're like, oh, I really want to do this thing that she's doing. You can go. And if you do that, you can do it kind of like once-ish around. Um, because each of you have this little campfire. And so you all have a campfire. And when you decide to share a space with somebody, it gets doused you know you've joined you've had your little campfire union and then it's over um but then it can get lit back up during certain things that happen anyway it's just so stinking cute you can buy gear that helps it that helps you visit other parks it's just horribly charming and terribly attractive like just just ridiculously attractive so here's what I mean the most I don't know not the best thing but like the most exciting thing <laughs> look at all so you're throughout the game you're gathering resources in order to visit parks right and this is how you visit the parks is by paying these resources and this is of course your points that you get and so you can reserve a park without visiting it so you're gonna visit you're gonna visit it later you've just like learned about it you're gonna visit it later um there's different like sort of bonus goals that you can get that are secret from your opponent's um, where you're like, oh, I need to visit 10 park, or I need to have 10 droplets of water on my cards, and then I'll get a bonus if I also take five pictures. Um, but, like, come on. Right? I can't believe that Isle Royale is only two points. You have to, like, get a ferry or a plane there. It should really be more points. 
but like how stinking enjoyable is this nonsense? So I won't lie. Sometimes you're getting the, the parks because they admit they kind of line up with your goals and what resources you have and like your little special gear that you have. But also sometimes you come across one where you're like, well, no, I just literally have to get Yellowstone because I've been there and I, or I need to go there or, you know, so you, there's that that kind of plays in as well. Right. There are also expansions for this. There is Parks Nightfall or Night something and then Parks Wildlife. Um, so there are other, there are expansions for this as well. I've not played either of those. Um, but I do believe that they might be available on Board Game Arena because I think I just saw that they're doing tournaments and that that was an option. So it's a great thing. Like I did, you know, like I said, you can try out a game to see if you like it. If you're just like, oh, I just want to own it because I'm collecting a collection, you know, no judgment. I understand that as well. Um, but yeah, we have a game. So that is Parks. It's lovely. They got me. It's a, again, it's an expensive game. It's also a game that you can pretty much, you can get it at um, your local board game shop, which would be the best choice, but you can also get it at Target um, if you don't have a board game shop in your area um, or you just, for whatever, whatever. You got an op you got options. You got options. So excited, so cute though. So thoughtfully designed, so clever. And there's definitely a reason the production, I mean, the production value is really great. And, and again, you're paying for that. So I don't, it is not an inexpensive game for the size of box you're getting and all of that, but it's terribly charming. And, you know, I don't know that this is a game that you're going to play a billion times. Um, but it's, I feel like it's, I feel like it's approachable. Like if you were teaching folks that are not board game people, I feel like it's pretty approachable. Like games are not complicated. You're moving your hiker. There are things that you could buy to make it easier to visit parks. It's not like a crazy com uh, concept. It's not, it's not abstract. I feel like it's pretty easy to communicate. Um, but yeah, it's so enjoyable. And so that's all I have for this time. Sorry, we're going to end on a, like, above shot. But I uh, have had some, I had a little bit of technical difficulty earlier. So I'll just end this way. Uh, thanks for visiting, and I'll talk to you next time. Bye.